Stop. Everything because someone is spreading a false rumor about you and it's aimed straight at yours truly. But here's the kicker. It's not just any rumor. It's about what you wear. What could possibly be so scandalous about your clothes? As much as it's tempting to brush it off and laugh it away, this rumor has deeper implications. It's not just about the clothes on my back. It's about the power of words and the weight they carry. Throughout our conversation, I'll be sharing some of the most surprising twists and turns of this rumor mill journey. Comment, yes. If you believe in God and do help support us through Super Chat or watching this video completely, you won't believe some of the things people are saying. But trust me, there's a silver lining amidst all the chaos, and I can't wait to share it with you. Apparently, someone's been going around saying that the clothes you wear are, well, let's just say they're not exactly flattering. It's like they're trying to paint you as some kind of fashion disaster, and let me tell you, it's really getting under my skin. But you know what? You've reached a turning point with this whole situation. Instead of letting it bring me down, you've decided to take action and stand up for myself. You refuse to let some silly rumor define me or dictate how you feel about myself. It's time to show everyone that I'm not defined by what I wear, but by who you am as a person. So, here's the plan. You are going to keep rocking the outfits that make me feel confident and comfortable, regardless of what anyone else thinks. You're not going to let negativity dull my shine or stop me from expressing myself through fashion. Because at the end of the day, the only opinion that truly matters is my own. I want you to know that you are determined to come out of this stronger and more empowered than ever before. You should focus on self-care and surrounding yourself with positive vibes and refuse to let anyone else's negativity bring me down or dim my light. If you see or hear anyone spreading rumors or negativity, let's shut it down together. Let's reinforce positivity and lift each other up because that's what true friendship is all about. In the end, you know that this whole situation will only make me stronger. It's a valuable lesson in resilience and self-love, and you'll determine to come out on top. At first, I didn't pay much attention to it, but the more I heard it, the more it started to eat away at my confidence. I found myself second-guessing every outfit choice, wondering if people were secretly judging me based on this absurd rumor. But you know what? Enough is enough. I refuse to let some silly gossip dictate how I feel about myself. So, I've made a decision to take action. I'm going to hold my head high, wear whatever makes me feel good, and not give a second thought to what anyone else thinks. I'm determined to turn this negative situation into something positive. From now on, I'm going to focus on self-love and self-care. I'll surround myself with positive influences, like you, who remind me of my worth and beauty, inside and out. I'm determined to turn this negative situation into something positive. From now on, I'm going to focus on self-love and self-care. I'll surround myself with positive influences, like you, who remind me of my worth and beauty, inside and out. So, here's where you come in, my dear friend. I need your support and encouragement more than ever. Let's lift each other up and remind ourselves that we're beautiful and worthy just the way we are. Together, we can crush this rumor and show the world that our confidence shines brighter than any false gossip. So, here's where you come in, my dear friend. I need your support and encouragement more than ever. Let's lift each other up and remind ourselves that we're beautiful and worthy just the way we are. Together, we can crush this rumor and show the world that our confidence shines brighter than any false gossip. As for the rumors swirling about my clothes, I've come to realize its insignificance in the grand tapestry of life. While it may ripple through the corridors of gossip, its impact on my spirit is solely determined by my reaction to it. I refuse to grant it the power to dictate my self-worth or define my character. Instead, I've resolved to shift my focus onto the enduring values that truly enrich my life. Love, with its boundless capacity to uplift and connect hearts, reigns supreme in my priorities. 
It is in nurturing and cherishing the bonds of love that I find true fulfillment. Friendship, too, holds a measurable significance. In the warmth of genuine companionship, I discover solace, laughter, and unwavering support. These relationships, built on trust and mutual understanding, are the pillars that fortify me against the storms of adversity. But perhaps most importantly, I've chosen to embrace the essence of inner beauty. Beyond the superficial veneer of appearances lies the radiant glow of authenticity, kindness, and compassion. It is the luminosity of the soul that truly illuminates the world around us, leaving a lasting imprint on hearts and minds. So, while the rumor about my clothes may linger in the whispers of idle chatter, it pales in comparison to the depth and richness of a life centered on love, friendship, and inner beauty. Together, let us embrace these cherished treasures that guide us along a journey infused with purpose and fulfillment. Join me in reciting this prayer. God will uproot every evil thing in your life. Imagine yourself standing at the edge of a beautiful, lush forest, the fresh scent of pine in the air, the soft rustle of leaves underfoot. From afar, it looks perfect, serene, full of life. Yet, as you step closer and look more carefully, you notice something. The forest is filled with weeds and thorns, choking the life out of the beautiful flowers and plants, distorting the view and the full potential of its beauty. Our lives can sometimes look like this forest. On the surface, it may seem perfect and full of life. Yet upon closer examination, we find weeds. Those evil things are forces entangling and choking our spiritual growth, inhibiting us from realizing our full potential in Christ. Today, I will help you to identify, confront, and uproot these forces so that you can flourish as God intended. The starting point of this journey is to recognize the existence of these forces. Just as one needs to recognize a weed before it can be uprooted from a beautiful garden, recognizing the existence of evil forces is the essential first step in our spiritual journey to freedom. These forces can come in various shapes and sizes, sometimes lurking in the shadows of our lives, almost invisible. Other times, these forces may be standing boldly in our paths, blatantly opposing us. Let's look at a story in 2 Kings 5. Gehazi was the servant of the prophet Elisha and had witnessed incredible miracles. Yet, when faced with the prospect of wealth and material possessions, Gehazi allowed greed, an evil force, to enter his heart. He lied to Naaman and Elisha to gain silver and garments he had not earned. His inability to recognize and resist this destructive force led to a grave consequence. He was struck with leprosy. This story is a vivid reminder that these evil forces can sometimes be found within us, hidden in our hearts, subtly influencing our own thoughts, actions, and choices. They can be attitudes or behaviors contrary to the fruits of the Spirit, such as greed, pride, anger, envy, bitterness, or unforgiveness. Recognizing these forces requires sincere self-examination. We need to hold a mirror to our hearts and ask ourselves, what attitudes and behaviors are hindering my walk with God? Or what aspects of my character do not reflect Christ's nature? The answers to these questions are clues to evil forces at work in our lives. It's not only the forces within that we need to recognize. The Bible reminds us in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. These external evil forces can present themselves as harmful relationships, negative environments, or societal pressures that pull us away from our commitment to God. The story of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel in 1 Kings 21 illustrates how external evil forces can affect our lives. Ahab allowed Jezebel, his wife, to lead him astray from God's commands, even to the point of murdering an innocent man, Naboth, just to acquire his vineyard. He failed to recognize the negative influence Jezebel had over him, and this led to their downfall. But fear not, for God's word serves as a powerful spotlight, shedding light on the hidden corners of our lives where these forces may lurk. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. The word helps us discern right from wrong, good from evil, allowing us to identify these evil forces. 
So, recognizing the evil forces both within and around us is a crucial part of uprooting every evil thing affecting our lives. It requires honesty, humility, and a deep reliance on God's word. But with God's help, we can not only recognize these forces but also overcome them. As 1 John 4 verse 4 reassures us, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now, where do these weeds or these evil forces come from? Every action has a cause. Every effect has a source. The evil forces at work in our lives causing strife, confusion, and discord also have a source, an origin from which they come. We're reminded of this in the book of Job, chapter 1. Job, a man described as upright and blameless, suddenly found his life in turmoil. He lost his wealth, his children, and his health in quick succession. While it may appear on the surface that these calamities were mere accidents or unfortunate coincidences, we know from the narrative that the source of Job's trials was none other than Satan himself. Satan, the enemy of our souls, is often the source of the evil forces we face. This isn't meant to scare us, but to bring awareness. Ephesians 6 verse 12 tells us that our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. Just as a weed's roots lie beneath the soil, hidden from view but firmly anchored, these forces often operate behind the scenes, causing havoc in our lives. However, there's an important distinction to remember. While Satan may be the source of these evil forces, we also have a role to play. Let's reflect on the story of King Saul as an example. In 1 Samuel 15, Saul was commanded by God to destroy the Amalekites completely. However, he disobeyed, sparing the king and keeping some of the spoils of war. This act of disobedience opened a door for an evil force to operate in Saul's life. 1 Samuel 16 verse 14 tells us that an evil spirit from God tormented Saul. It wasn't that God created this evil spirit, but rather that Saul's disobedience removed God's protective hand, allowing the evil force to torment him. This highlights a key truth about this source of evil forces. While they may originate from the enemy, our actions and choices can invite or resist these forces. Disobedience, compromise, and unrighteousness can create an environment where these forces can thrive. Understanding the source of evil forces helps us to fight them effectively. It reveals the need for obedience to God's commands, a constant reliance on His grace, and a resolute stand against the wiles of the enemy. And the most encouraging part is we are not left defenseless against these forces. James 4 verse 7 promises, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Despite the power of the source of these evil forces, the one who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Therefore, as we recognize the source of these evil forces, let's not despair or fear. Instead, let's submit to God, uphold His commands, and trust in His power to overcome and uproot these forces from our lives. As we move forward in this journey, we need to be armed and ready, just like a hiker equipping themselves before an expedition. We need to equip ourselves with the armor of God. The battle against evil forces isn't fought with physical weapons. No sword, shield, or arrow crafted by human hands can stand against the spiritual forces we contend with. However, we have been equipped with a divine armor, tailored by the Creator of the universe Himself. This is the armor of God. This idea isn't foreign to the scriptures. Take the story of King David as a young boy preparing to fight Goliath, the giant who had defied the armies of the living God. In 1 Samuel 17, King Saul tried to clothe David in his own armor, but David couldn't move comfortably in it. Instead, he chose to face the giant with just his sling and five smooth stones. Why? Because David knew his real protection came from God. His reliance on God's power was his true armor. The armor of God is beautifully described in Ephesians 6 verses 13 to 17. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Each piece of this divine armor serves a distinct purpose. The belt of truth combats the lies of the enemy, 
The breastplate of righteousness protects our hearts from accusations and guilt. The readiness of the gospel of peace stabilizes us amidst the chaos of battle. The shield of faith deflects the fiery darts of doubt, fear, and worry. The helmet of salvation guards our minds from thoughts that lead to sin and despair. The sword of the Spirit, God's Word, allows us to counterattack, cutting through deceptions and bringing to light the enemy's schemes. We might not be able to see this armor, but its power is real and tangible. In our journey to uproot every evil thing or force affecting our lives, the armor of God is essential. We must consciously choose to put it on each day, trusting in the protection and power it provides. And as we stand firm in this divine armor, we'll find ourselves more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, able to resist the schemes of the enemy and uproot every trace of evil in our lives. Next, we need to tap into the power of prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting are two spiritual disciplines that have been observed throughout the ages, serving as powerful tools in our fight against evil forces. Though they are different, they often go hand in hand, each one enhancing the power of the other. In the book of Esther, we encounter a compelling example of the power of prayer and fasting. The Jews in Persia were facing a grave threat of annihilation due to the schemes of Haman, an evil force in their midst. Upon learning of this plot, Queen Esther called for all the Jews to fast and pray for three days, while she did the same before approaching the king. This was a dangerous move, but the risk was necessary to save her people. Esther 4 verse 16 records her resolution, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. After this period of fasting and prayer, Esther found favor in the sight of the king, and the Jews were saved from destruction. This story reveals the power of prayer and fasting in uprooting the evil forces at work in our lives. It can bring about divine intervention, shifts in situations, and break strongholds that human effort alone cannot. Prayer is our communication with God. It's our way of bringing our needs, concerns, fears, and hopes to Him. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 encourages us to pray without ceasing, emphasizing the importance of constant communication with God. Fasting, on the other hand, is a voluntary act of refraining from food or other activities as a physical expression of our spiritual hunger and desperation. It shows God that we are willing to sacrifice our physical needs and wants for spiritual growth and breakthrough. Daniel, another biblical figure, understood the power of prayer and fasting. In Daniel 9, he fasted, prayed, and confessed sins on behalf of his people, seeking God's mercy and intervention. God responded by sending the angel Gabriel with a message of hope and promise for the future. The Apostle James, in James 5 verse 16, tells us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. When paired with fasting, this power is amplified. Fasting helps us to humble ourselves, focus on God, and heighten our spiritual awareness, making our prayers even more effective. As we face evil forces in our lives, let's remember the power that lies in prayer and fasting. They're not just religious rituals, they're spiritual weapons that can help us uproot the evil affecting us. As we devote ourselves to prayer and fasting, we can expect God to move powerfully on our behalf, bringing deliverance, breaking chains, and leading us into the abundant life that He has promised us. Next, we need the Word of God on our journey. In our quest to uproot every evil force that affects our lives, we must not overlook the most potent weapon we possess, the Word of God. It's more than just a collection of historical narratives, poetic expressions, or moral guidelines. The Word of God is living, active, and powerful. Consider the account in Joshua 1. As Joshua took over leadership after Moses' death, he faced the daunting task of leading the Israelites into the Promised Land, a land occupied by formidable foes. But God, in His infinite wisdom, did not hand Joshua a physical weapon. Instead, He handed him the Book of the Law, His Word. God told Joshua in Joshua 1 verse 8 to keep this Book of the Law always on his lips, to meditate on it day and night so that he may be careful to do everything written in it. Then he would be prosperous and successful. This wasn't an ordinary book. It was a powerful weapon for success and victory. The Word of God, as our weapon, serves two primary functions. 
defense, and offense. Defensively, it guards our hearts and minds, acting as a shield against the lies and deceptions of the enemy. When evil forces whisper words of doubt, fear, guilt, or inadequacy, we can counteract those whispers with the promises and truth found in God's Word. Offensively, the Word of God serves as a sword. Ephesians 6 verse 17 depicts the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit, our primary offensive weapon in spiritual battles. It's the tool we use to counterattack, to take ground, and to advance against the forces of evil. A lesser-known story in the Bible that highlights the power of God's Word is found in 2 Kings 22. King Josiah, after coming across the Book of the Law, initiated a nationwide reform based on God's Word. He removed idols, eliminated false priests, and restored true worship, effectively uprooting the evils that had infiltrated the land. The key to this transformation was the Word of God. In the face of evil forces, the Word of God is our sure defense and our potent offense. It equips us to recognize lies, stand firm in truth, and boldly advance against any force that stands against us. It's our guidebook for living, our comfort in distress, our hope in despair, and our weapon in battle. To effectively wield this weapon, we must be immersed in it, reading it, meditating on it, memorizing it, and applying it in our lives. As we become more grounded in the language of God, we become better at recognizing the enemy's schemes and more effective in fighting them. The Word of God is the living, breathing voice of God, a voice that breaks chains, pulls down strongholds, and uproots every evil force. As Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Armed with this weapon, we can confidently confront and conquer every evil force affecting our lives. In order to ensure that we are not allowing any weed to grow back, we need to live a life of righteousness. Any sin in our life can act as a seed from which these evil forces can grow back. Righteous living ensures that no such seed finds space in our life, thereby protecting us from these forces. Living righteously is, therefore, a crucial element in uprooting every evil thing or force affecting our lives. It's about aligning our thoughts, words, and actions with God's standards of holiness and ideousness. But how can we, as imperfect human beings, live righteously? The Bible provides the answer in numerous examples for us. One such example can be found in the life of Daniel. Living as a captive in Babylon, Daniel found himself in a culture that was contrary to his faith. The Babylonians worshipped different gods, ate food that was considered unclean by Jewish standards, and followed practices that were in direct conflict with God's commands. Yet Daniel stood firm in his faith to live righteously. In Daniel 1 verse 8, it says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Despite the pressures and potential consequences, Daniel chose to honor God above pleasing men. As a result, Daniel experienced God's favor and protection. When he was thrown into the lion's den for praying to God despite the king's decree, God shut the mouths of the lions and preserved his life. Daniel's commitment to live righteously amidst adversity led to the manifestation of God's power and glory. Living righteously isn't always easy, but it is always rewarding. It provides a clear conscience, inner peace, divine protection, and favor. The Bible encourages us in Galatians 6 verse 9, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Righteous living involves a commitment to honesty, integrity, kindness, and love. But it goes beyond just behaving ethically. It is about surrendering our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us and transform us from within. Titus 2 verses 12 to 13 instructs us. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we live righteously, we create an atmosphere that is hostile to evil forces. Ephesians 4 verse 27 tells us that sin gives the enemy a foothold in our lives, but righteousness slams the door shut, denying him any opportunity. The door in his face, 
It uproots the hidden things that could potentially harm us and positions us to experience the fullness of God's blessings. So let's be inspired by the likes of Daniel, who despite being in an environment that promoted ungodliness, chose to live a life of righteousness. It's a personal decision we all have to make, but it's a decision that carries profound implications. Living righteously not only uproots the evil in our lives, but also establishes a foundation for abundant and eternal life. Now, much like a seasoned explorer who consistently checks their route to ensure they're not lost, another thing we need to do is to constantly examine our spiritual lives. Just as we regularly check our physical health, it's equally crucial to consistently check our spiritual health. This checkup involves examining our lives to identify and address any spiritual deficiencies or ailments that may be affecting our relationship with God. The Bible emphasizes the importance of this self-examination. In 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Paul instructs us to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. He says, test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? This process involves examining our thoughts, words, actions, and motives against the standard of God's word. One individual who serves as an example of this is King David. Despite being a man after God's own heart, David was not without fault. He committed grave sins, including adultery and murder. However, when the prophet Nathan confronted him about his sins in 2 Samuel 12, David didn't react defensively. He acknowledged his wrongdoing, repented sincerely, and sought God's forgiveness. David's prayer of repentance in Psalm 51 displays a heart that understands the need for a spiritual checkup. In verse 10, David prays, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This prayer not only reflects David's remorse over his past actions, but also his desire for inward renewal and righteousness. But a spiritual checkup is not only for times when we blatantly sinned. It's a practice we should engage in regularly. We need to constantly evaluate if we're growing in our faith, bearing the fruits of the Spirit, walking in obedience to God's commands, and living a life of love and service to others. It involves asking tough questions and being ready to make necessary changes. The story of the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2 verses 1 to 7 offers insight into this. Jesus commended them for their perseverance, hard work, and refusal to tolerate wickedness. However, he also pointed out that they had forsaken their first love. They had lost the passion they initially had for Christ and his works. They were diligent in their works, but their hearts were not right. The Ephesians were called to remember their former state, repent, and do the things they did at first. This call to self-examination was an invitation to perform a spiritual checkup, recognize where they had gone wrong, and return to their original passion and love for Christ. A consistent spiritual checkup helps us identify the weeds we need to uproot and the seeds we need to sow. It keeps our spiritual life healthy and our walk with God on track. It's an opportunity to receive God's grace for our shortcomings and His wisdom for our growth. Remember, this checkup is not to bring condemnation, but to bring conviction that leads to change. Romans 8 verse 1 assures us, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us embrace this practice with open hearts and the assurance of God's love and grace. Regular self-examination and repentance ensure that we are aligned with God's will and no evil force is finding its way back into our lives. Now, even with all this preparation, there will be moments when we directly encounter these forces. In such moments, we're called to resist. James 4 verse 7 offers us a potent strategy to confront these forces. Submit yourselves, then, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resisting the devil is an active stance. It involves standing firm against his schemes and rejecting his lies. To resist, we must be aware of his strategies and counter them with God's truth. In the Old Testament, the prophet Nehemiah provides us with an example of resisting opposition. When tasked with rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, he faced opposition from Sambalat and Tobiah, who attempted to discourage the Israelites and halt their work. They ridiculed, plotted, and threatened, trying to instill fear and doubt in Nehemiah and his workers. But how did Nehemiah resist? Nehemiah 4 verse 14 records his response, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, 
who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Nehemiah countered their lies with the truth of God's greatness. He kept his focus on God's mission and encouraged the people to do the same. Nehemiah also resisted by strengthening the defenses as seen in Nehemiah 4 verses 16 to 18 and by praying to God for protection. He did not ignore the threats, but neither did he let them deter him from his mission. Resisting the devil involves a similar strategy. We need to recognize his lies, counter them with God's truth, strengthen our spiritual defenses, and persist in prayer. We must remain steadfast in our faith, rooted in God's word, and committed to our mission. In Matthew 4 verses 1 to 11, another illustration can be found in the life of Jesus himself. In the wilderness, Jesus was tempted by the devil, but each time the devil proposed a temptation, Jesus countered it with scripture. He resisted the devil by speaking the truth of God's word, demonstrating the power of the word as a weapon against evil forces. This approach still applies to us today. When the enemy attempts to sow seeds of fear, doubt, insecurity, or temptation in our lives, we resist by countering those lies with God's truths. We remind ourselves of who God is and who we are in Him. We declare His promises and stand firm in His truth. To resist the devil is to stand firm against his schemes, armed with the truth of God's word, covered in prayer, and steadfast in faith. It is to submit to God, align our lives with His will, and stay committed to His purposes. As we do this, we can trust in the promise that the devil will flee from us. Our God is greater, our cause is righteous, and our victory is assured. Next, let's not forget that this uprooting journey is not one we need to undertake alone. We need Christian fellowship. This is not just about a social gathering. Christian fellowship is a vital part of our spiritual life, a platform for mutual encouragement, prayer, learning, and growth in faith. Through fellowship, we draw strength from one another and collectively resist the forces that seek to pull us away from God. When we fellowship with other believers, we create an environment that fosters spiritual growth and resilience. We can share our struggles, learn from each other's experiences, pray for each other, and support each other in our journey. This unity can be a source of strength, especially when we face trials or temptations. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 echoes this. Therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So, through fellowship, we can uplift each other and stand together in faith. In the story of Moses, Aaron, and her during the battle against the Amalekites in Exodus 17 verses 8 to 16, we see a demonstration of the power of fellowship. As long as Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. But when he let his hands down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses grew tired, Aaron and her held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other so that his hands remained steady till sunset, and Joshua overcame the Amalekite army. This story illustrates how fellowship can help us in our spiritual battles. Like Aaron and her, we can support each other, pray for each other, and help keep each other focused on God. We are reminded in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Our shared faith, collective prayer, and mutual encouragement make us stronger and harder to defeat. So remember, we're not just aimlessly wandering in the forest. We're on a mission to clear it of the weeds, the evil forces. We are equipped, we are prepared, and we are not alone. In Christ, we have the victory, and through him, we can uproot every evil thing or force affecting our lives. Also, we have reason to be hopeful and courageous in the face of these destructive forces. We have a potent defense, the power of the cross. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has triumphed over all powers of darkness. This victory is not just for him, but is also for us. We share in this victory as believers. Our position in Christ gives us authority over these forces. For it is written in Luke 10 verse 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now, let us go to the Lord in prayer. I want you to pray this prayer with me so that you can have all the blessings of this prayer. Let us pray to our gracious and loving God. Dear Heavenly Father, today, I come before you in the quietness of my soul, acknowledging your sovereignty and grace. 
Lord, I ask for your forgiveness, even as I forgive those who come against me. In the name of Jesus, I stand against every evil force that seeks to attack my life. I declare that they have no power over me or my loved ones because we belong to God. Lord, I command every seed of discord, every root of bitterness, every trace of deceit to be uprooted from my life right now. I declare that my heart, mind, and soul are under your rule and authority, and I am not subject to any evil power. I turn my eyes to you, Father, acknowledging that you are the source of my strength and my deliverance. In the name of Jesus, I reject the lies of the enemy, the whispers of failure, fear, and doubt. I stand firm on the truth that I am loved, redeemed, and empowered by you. O Lord, you have given me the power of your cross and the symbol of your victory over sin and death. I embrace this power and declare in the name of Jesus that every chain holding me back is shattered, every bondage of the enemy is broken, and I am free. Father, thank you for your armor that you have provided for me. I put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. Clothed in your armor, O Lord, I am prepared to stand firm and resist the enemy's attacks. Lord, I am confident not in my strength but in yours. I draw my courage from you, knowing that you have overcome the world. Father, I rely on the power of prayer and fasting, not as a ritual but as a genuine expression of my dependence on you. Your word is my defense, O Lord. I stand on your promises, holding onto them in the face of all adversities. Father, I seek to live righteously. I know that I am not perfect, but you are perfect, O Lord. I seek to align my thoughts, words, and actions with your will. Strengthen me, Lord, so that I may live in a manner that is pleasing to you. Father, I put my trust in your grace and mercy. I lean on your understanding and not my own. Thank you for your promise of victory. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Curious to discover more life-changing insights like these? Then dive right into our next video. It's a journey you won't want to miss. Click on the video and let's keep the universal's wisdom flowing.